Hello, and welcome to the Power BI April 2020 update. In this video, we'll explore what's new this month and see some demos of the highlights. But before we explore this month's release, we have an important update for you on the modern filter pane experience. Originally, we were going to automatically migrate all reports both in the Power BI desktop and Power BI service to the modern filter pane experience in April. However, in light of the challenges COVID-19 presents to your work environment, we've decided to postpone this automatic migration to May 2020. Hopefully, this extra time gives you more flexibility to tweak or customise any of your formatting before your reports are upgraded. And now, on to this month's release. We have several new features for you in the reporting section. First, we have the new Personalize Visuals Preview feature. Now you can explore and personalize visuals all while viewing a report without having to familiarize yourself with the full editing experience of Power BI Desktop. Sujatha will show us a demo of this new feature. As a report author, sometimes it's difficult to build a single report that can meet all of the needs of your end users. Sometimes you'll see that users want to see a different type of visual, they want to swap out what's on the access or see a different measure. Uh, in order to allow them to do so, previously you'd have to either give them edit permissions or they just download the report and create a new version of it, which, you know, sooner rather than later, that report becomes out of date with the original copy. So with this new feature, we want to give end users the power to make those tweaks and changes without having to deal with any change management issues or have to bottleneck on the uh, report author to make those changes for them. So let's take a look at the consumption experience for this feature um, and then I'll show you guys how to set this up and how to configure it uh, based on your needs. So if your author enables this feature, you'll see this new entry point called personalize this visual. When the end user clicks on it, they'll see the visual type and they'll see all the properties associated with this visual. So let's start with some few basic changes. Let's say I want to change the visualization type. So I'll click on the visual and then I can click on another visual that I want to change it to. So let's say I'm going to change it to a stacked area chart. You'll see it instantly changes. Um, we can even try, you know, stack column chart. We can try cluster column chart. So it's a really easy way for me to explore what are the different types of visuals uh, that, that I'm allowed to change it to, and maybe there's a certain visual that I prefer uh, to represent my data with. Now let's see uh, some other examples. Uh, let's say I want to change the access, so I want to replace it. So I'll click on whatever dimension I want to change. So in this case, I want to change it instead of year over year. I want to look at a different dimension. So let's go ahead and try changing it to a uh, platform. So now you see it updates like that. Let's try actually removing uh, the legend here. So I don't want to see any of this color coded. So I'll click in the dot 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 menu and I'll click remove field. Now that I've removed a legend, I have uh, the option of adding more measures if I want. So if I want to color code based on a measure rather than a dimension. So let's say I go click the plus button here and let's search for other measures here. So let's add um, EU sales and let's also add um, sales from uh, North America. And so if let's say I just want to compare those two, I can also just simply remove uh, the global sales. So if I want to save this visual as it is, there's uh, one way I can do that is I can save it as a personal bookmark. So what I'll do is I'll add it as a personal bookmark up here and I can name it um, my view. And let's say if I want to continuously see this view every time I return to the report, I can actually uh, update this and say, make it default. So that means whenever I load this report, I'll always see this view that I've selected. Um, and then if I want to undo this visual, uh, let's say I want to reset just the visual on its own without resetting all of the changes I've made, 
I can do so by clicking reset this visual. Um, and then one more thing I want to show you guys uh, in terms of the types of capabilities in terms of managing changes is let's say if I've made, you know, a bad change of let's say I've just removed value and then I see nothing here and I want to quickly revert that, I can revert any of my changes real easily with this uh, eraser icon. So if I select that, it'll quickly undo any of the recent change changes I've made starting from the point that I opened the flyout. So now let me show the creator experience and how you can set this up for your reports um, as well as how you can configure it further. So before you can enable this for your report, you'll need to turn it on in the preview feature section. So you'll see a personalized visuals uh, option and you'll need to make sure that that's toggled on. Once it's enabled, you'll then see in your report settings, you'll see a new option here called personalized visuals preview. You'll need to make sure that that's turned on. Once it's enabled, you'll see that there's a new icon on your visuals. This indicates that this visual can be personalized by your report readers. So you'll notice that you don't have the personalization experience here, but you'll have it in the consumption view in the service. So if you go to the format pane and under visual header, you can scroll down and there's an option for you to choose to turn off uh, this feature per visual. So let's say if there's a certain visual where you don't want to enable this for, you can just go ahead and toggle it off and you'll no longer see that icon both in the uh, edit view and the reading view uh, of the service. And so it's as simple as that. Once you're done um, making those tweaks to the different visuals that you do or do not want to have this experience for, you can go publish to the service and your end users uh, can consume the feature as I demoed earlier. One more thing I want to mention is since this is a preview feature, we really do appreciate any feedback that you have uh, on the experience, both from the author perspective and the consumer perspective. So any of that feedback, feel free to comment in our form post um, and let us know what you think. We're also previewing change detection for automatic refresh. This new option allows you to base your page refresh on changes to your data rather than on a specific refresh interval. Now Miguel will walk us through a demo of change detection. With this release, we're bringing a new option for page refresh for reports that sit on top of direct query data sources. This new capability is called change detection. It allows you to create a change detection measure that uh, will pull the data source for data changes and will only trigger the refresh of the visuals in a page if the data has changed. So let's take a look at how that it's done. Uh, let's go to the modeling tab and then you can see here that there's a new button called change detection. So clicking on that will take you to the experience. Another couple of options to get there. If you right click on a field, you can see that change detection is also here. And last but not least, if you happen to be on the page refresh menu under the formatting pane, you can add a change detection measure from there. They will all take you to the same place, which is the menu that we have for creating change detection. Uh, number one and foremost, you can see that there's a little diamond uh, right next to change detection to communicate that this is a premium only feature. And then you are presented with uh, two options for measure type. You can create a new one from scratch or you can choose an existing one. Let's go with new one first. So let's say I want to detect changes based on the ID of the sale. And instead of maximum, I want to count how many transactions we have. And then you can choose uh, how often you check for changes or you poll for changes. Let's say we want to do this every one minute and then we're going to click apply. What will happen here is that a new measure is created, change the detection count and explains uh, what it is. If I click on it, you can see that we have the DAX code in there. Um, and also the icon has changed, pointing out that this is the one change detection measure allowed in this particular uh, model. Uh, the other option, like we saw before, is actually to reuse a measure that you already have. So in this particular case, let's go to total customers, which is the count of all customers' IDs in the table. And then we're going to go change detection. You can see that it already pre-selects existing you have total customer and we're going to check every five seconds, let's say. So I'm going to click apply. 
and we can see that we have the change detection there. So after publishing the report, we are here in the Power BI service, and also we already set up the credentials for the direct query source that we're using. So we're gonna go into edit mode uh, to see how we set up page refresh with the change detection measure. Uh, we're gonna go into the formatting pane. We're gonna expand the page refresh section. We're gonna turn this on, and you can see that we have already previously selected automatic page refresh every one second to show what is the current option, which is every visual gets updated every second. Now we're gonna go again here and we're gonna switch to change detection. And you can see that Power BI is showing us the measure that we're using, the one that we selected before, and how often we are checking for changes, which is every five seconds. So if we go back here, what's happening uh, under the hood behind the scenes is that uh, the Power BI model is firing that query to the source and only when that measure changes, we update the visuals on this particular page. And you can see that the behavior is very, very similar, but we only do it when the data changes. So for example, in this case, we have the last three minutes of orders and nothing is changing right now, but when the change, the change kicks in, we get the updated visual. Now, it's important to uh, highlight that for you to use this feature in the service, your capacity admin has to go into the data sets works workload in the capacity admin portal and turn on both uh, or the one that you want to use automatic page refresh and change detection and also they have the ability to set up a minimum interval so if your interval is shorter than what the minimum the admin set up uh, we will respect the one here so even though you might have one second maybe the admin only set up five seconds or 30 we are going to go as fast as uh, it's allowed here and a couple of uh, last things that we need to highlight it's that uh, remember it's only direct query sources uh, you're only allowed to specify one change detection measure per model. Um, and in desktop, when you set up change detection for now, you won't see the visuals updating. Uh, it's a premium only feature and the premium capacity admin uh, must turn this on in the admin portal. Next, we are excited to bring you a preview of the relative time filter. When the filter is applied on the page or report level, all visuals under that level are synchronized to the same time range, allowing you to filter to smaller windows of time. Sujatha will show us a demo of this new feature. So before I get into the demo of the feature, I want to first explain different scenarios of why relative time slicer and relative time filtering uh, can be helpful. So first, let's imagine an example where we're looking at video views over time. So I have a really simple data set here where time is a column and then views is uh, another column. So let's say I'm going to go ahead and turn on uh, APR for this page. So that means it's going to automatically refresh, let's say, at a one second interval. So what I'm going to do is in the formatting options uh, for the page, I'm just going to make sure that page refresh is turned on. Um, and then I'm gonna set the duration to one second. So you'll notice here that this is a relative date filter and the smallest time window I can put here is last one day. Uh, and you'll see that, you know, yes, this uh, card right here is updating, but it almost looks like the visual itself, uh, this line chart here is not updating. And the reason being is because even though my data is very volatile, so it's changing very rapidly, my time window is not small enough for you to really see those changes uh, in the visual itself. So with that being said, this is a great example of why you would want relative time filter in this scenario. So let's flip over to a different page. So I'm going to turn this off and let's flip over to this page here. So this is the exact same page, except the only thing I've done is I've changed the time slicer from relative date to relative time, and I said last one minute. So now let's go ahead and turn on page refresh uh, for this page. So you can see the difference is quite dramatic. You actually see uh, the line chart at the bottom um, reflecting a more narrow time window, and you're seeing that change happen uh, in more uh, real time. So now the way that I set this up, so uh, it's very similar with relative date. So you just drag in 
uh, your date or time field uh, into the field well, and uh, you're using a slicer here. And then in the option setting, uh, you'll see over here is you just need to go ahead and select relative time. So once that's selected, you'll see here that you have the options of choosing uh, last, next, or this period. And then when you specify either last or next, uh, you can then specify uh, a specific quantity, and this needs to be a whole number. So you can say last one minute, last five minutes, uh, etc. And then you'll need to specify a unit of time, so whether that be hours or minutes. You'll also notice this handy feature that shows you the exact time window um, that all the visuals uh, on this page are being filtered to. Um, so one important thing to note here is that if you're using um, a non-UTC time, you'll need to convert that before you can use it for this feature. Uh, and another thing to note is that how we synchronize the visuals is all based on an anchor time. So you'll see that the filter restatement for this visual will line up with the other visuals as well. This exact same filter on this range is applied to all of the visuals on this page. So one more thing I wanna note is that if for some reason you want to save some real estate on the canvas and you don't want the relative time filter uh, directly on the canvas, you can also choose to create one in the filter pane itself. So you just drag in uh, your fields here and you'll need to change the type from basic filtering to relative time. Uh, and then you can just add in. So in the last, let's say one uh, minute and then you can hit apply. So that's one way that you can filter it based on the filter pane rather than an on-canvas slicer. Next, we are introducing Rectangular Lasso Select across visuals. This new feature allows report authors to select visuals by clicking and dragging over the canvas to create a selection box, making it easier to select multiple visuals at a time. Rien will show us a demo for this feature. Rectangle Select for Visuals is a simple but useful feature that allows you to select visuals with a simple click and drag. It's great for selecting many visuals at a time, allowing you to move them however you want while you edit your report. And because this functions the same way as clicking on them one by one, you can still add or remove visuals from your selection by holding down on the control key and clicking the visual, or still holding the control key using the rectangle select again. So hopefully, this makes selecting many visuals a more fluid and convenient process while you're editing your report. We are also expanding conditional formatting to include totals and subtotals in tables and matrices. Now when setting conditional formatting rules, you will be able to choose to apply those rules to your values, totals, or both. Rian will take us through a demo of this feature. This month, we're excited to introduce a simple conditional formatting option for totals and subtotals in tables and matrices. With this feature, you'll be able to choose whether or not you'd like to apply the conditional formatting rules you set to the cell values, the totals and subtotals, or both. We've enabled this option for background color, font color, icons, and web URL. So let's look at this matrix with profit and loss data. And suppose we'd like to color the backgrounds of the cells with losses red and profits blue. To do this, we can go into the conditional formatting pane and turn on the background color toggle. This applies a default. Since we're doing our own rule, let's go into advanced controls. So the new dialog, the new option, is the apply to option. Here we're not using the color scale since we're doing a binary if positive and if negative. So over here, Let's say that if it's greater than some arbitrarily small negative number and less than zero, which makes it negative, we'll say it's red. And then if it's greater than zero, but less than some arbitrarily large number, then it's blue. But we should apply this to more than just values. Let's apply this to the whole table, values and totals. And now we see that all of the backgrounds are in a garish blue or red based on whether or not they're positive or negative. Uh, supposing we wanted to apply this only to totals and not to every single cell, let's go back into advanced controls, change this from values and totals to just totals, and click OK. And now we can see that our profit totals are 
blue, and our loss totals are red. And that's that. So keep in mind that you'll have to manually set the thresholds or ranges of your conditional formatting rules, and that applies not only to the rules, you know, but also to color scale. And also keep in mind that for matrices, the word values still refers to the lowest visible level of the matrix hierarchy, and this mirrors its previous functionality. This feature is something that many of you have been asking for, and we understand that the capabilities that we added today won't cover all of your use cases. We've got a lot more planned for this feature, but we do hope that our current solution addresses some of your more basic needs. But please keep sending us feedback on this feature so that we can deliver more versatile functionality in the future. Next, the custom theme dialog is now generally available. We appreciate all of the feedback you've provided us throughout the preview process, and we hope the dialog will help you more conveniently create better looking reports. Tessa will walk us through all of the updates to the feature. You may have noticed the last couple of months that our new theme dialog has been in preview, and this month it's being GA'd. So you can see the new theme gallery shows up in our ribbon here. And if I hover over some of the different options, you can see the name of the new themes show up in the tooltips. And if I click on this drop down, then you'll see this nice drop down that shows up with two different sections of the different kinds of themes that show up in my report. Um, we have this section called this report that shows you what your report currently shows and Power BI, which shows the themes that come out of the box in Power BI. If you go to the option at the bottom of this dropdown called Customize Current Theme, and you open it up, this shows our new theme dialog that is G8. So in this dialog, you can rename um, or you can redefine the names and colors uh, and how they'll appear. You can modify the text, um, your visuals and the colors that show up there, and even the backgrounds of these visuals, and do the same for pages and their filter pane. And there are also some advanced options for some of them, and we have some really great documentation you can follow to learn more about each of these elements. If I want to create a new custom theme or modify this theme, I can go to each color and you'll see there are a couple of different color pickers here. Um, you can go through the um, color spectrum as well and you can input your hex code if you have a specific color you want to use or you can even input RGB values as well. So I'm just pick, gonna pick a couple of different colors um, so you can see how my report might be changed. And if I choose a few different ones, I can also name my theme. So I might name this my company branding. And I save my theme. You can see that my report has updated to reflect the colors that I chose for my theme. The theme gallery also takes in information from the canvas to form these icons. So the theme that I'm currently using is always going to show up as the leftmost icon in the theme gallery. And if I hover over, you see this tooltip shows up that tells me that it's my current theme and the name of that custom theme that I uh, defined is in parentheses. So here I named it my company branding. And if I open up the drop down again, you can see that a new section has shown up. We have a custom section that shows up with your theme that you just created. You can also switch back and forth between that theme and the other Power BI themes that we have. And the dropdown won't lose that custom theme that you just made. You can also export your custom theme as a JSON file. In order to do that, you just go to the option at the bottom that says Save Current Theme. When you export it as a JSON file, you have all the options available to you as before that um, allow you for more fine-tuned and granularity for modifying your theme. And lastly, for the reporting section, we're introducing a change to the way you access conditional formatting in the formatting pane, making the entry point easier for you to find. Now you can conditionally format your visuals using the function button next to the input you would like to format. Let's move on to the analytics section. 
we're excited to announce direct query support for two of our AI visuals, the decomposition tree and the key influences preview features. Here's Justina to give us a quick look into this update. The key influencers visual as well as the decomposition tree now both work in direct query scenarios. In this first example, I have built the key influencers visual against some imported data. But as you can see in my data model, I have some data that I am connecting to in a direct query manner. And so these visualizations now work in composite models. In the second example, I actually have the decomposition tree built directly on top of my direct query source. Next, the decomposition tree visual also now supports tooltips, allowing you to customize what users see when they hover over data bars in the tree. Justina will show us a demo of this new addition. The decomposition tree allows you to take any measure and break it down by multiple different dimensions in any order that you want. With the new release, you can now add tooltips to your decomposition tree. In this case, we're looking at the percentage of products that are on back order, meaning they are out of stock. And we also want to be able to visualize how much this is worth for us in terms of dollar amounts. So I'm going to drag over the back order dollar amount measure into my tooltips. And now when I hover over my tree, I can see this additional information. So I'm able to visualize both the percentage of products in the back order and how much they are worth in terms of dollar amount. We also have a few updates to Q&A. You can now suggest your own questions to help end users. Teach Q&A now supports measure conditions and Q&A is now supported on Power BI datasets. Serena will take us through each of these updates right now. The suggested questions in Q&A can help you get started with a question. Previously, Power BI automatically suggested some questions to start with. This month, we're adding the option to define your own questions to show up in the visual. In the new Suggest Questions section in Q&A Setup, you can create a list of questions to be shown in the Q&A visual. The questions will show up in Q&A in the same order as they've been created in. For example, I can add a question to look at top categories by total orders. As I add this question to the list, I can also see a preview of, of the answer. Let's add, a, add another one. I'm now going to look at orders by ship day, and I'm going to add that as well. Now, as I save this, this, will be, this list will be added to the Q&A visual. And as I go back to the visual, I will now see the questions that I've suggested. Another improvement we made to Q&A this month is the support for measure conditions in Teach Q&A. With Teach Q&A, you can add definitions to make Q&A work better with, with your data model. In the first release of Teach Q&A, you could only create definitions on columns. This month, we're adding support for measure conditions. This means you can use existing measures in a definition, or you can calculate the measures in the Q&A expression itself. For example, in this data set, I have customers and orders made by these customers. So if I want to define my customers that are profitable when they have at least 15 orders in the order column, I can do that here in Teach Q&A. I will submit the question. And now I can say that customers that have a total order of more than 15 are profitable. You can see the preview over here and that it will update to the, the countries with customers that are profitable in the, in the preview result. The last update I want to share is that you can now use Q&A when you're connected to a Power BI data set. When you connect to a Power BI data set from Power BI Desktop, you can add a Q&A visual to the canvas and ask your questions. Let me show you an example. I'm connecting to 
a data set that was shared with me in the Power BI service um, on Summer Olympics. And I can just, without doing anything, add a Q&A visual to the canvas now. And start asking my question. In the visualization section, we have a few new visual options available for you on AppSource. First, we have the Radar Polar Chart by XVIZ. This chart is ideal for visualizing multivariate data, highlighting outliers and commonality by comparing one or more categories across different variables. It delivers several highly requested features around access scaling data label customization, and legend support. Next is Comic Gen by Gramina, a visual which adds comic characters to your reports whose emotions, pose, and angle can be controlled by data. You can use these to represent up to two KPIs at a time, visualizing each as an emotion or pose on one of two different characters. Next is the Pareto chart by CO2 Graphs. This chart allows you to visualize cause and frequency to understand the key drivers of a process. And next up, we have the growth rate combo chart by Genie. This is a line and column combo chart displaying percentage differences between selected column categories. This chart is ideal to display growth rates in time series, an important metric in finance and other fields. And lastly, in this section, we have the Smart Filter Pro Visual by OKViz. OK this is the premium version of their Smart Filter, which provides a compact slicer that applies filters in different ways, including autocomplete and incremental search in the drop down list. Links to more information about all of these visuals, as well as links to download them from AppSource, can be found in the video description below. You may also notice that our visualization icons have a new look. These new icons have a higher color contrast to improve accessibility and are better aligned with the icons you may already be familiar with in Excel. You'll find them both in the visualizations pane and in the new personalized visuals experience. We also have several new additions to our Power BI templates on AppSource. Template apps allow you to save time by connecting your own data to a pre-built report that you can personalize and share. This month's template apps include the Power Platform Center of Excellence Start Kit, which provides a holistic view of the resource usage in your tenant. Azure Cognitive Search, which is a cloud search service with built-in AI enrichment, and a variety of COVID-19 apps which help track cases over time by location. If you're interested in trying out any of these template apps, please check out their links in the video description. Next, in the data preparation section, we're excited to bring you some enhancements to the query diagnostics feature, which we made generally available last month. This month, we're adding a query diagnostics options page in the options dialog, allowing you to configure your diagnostics output and performance in query diagnostics. Here's Colin to show us a demo of these improvements. In April Power BI Desktop, we've added two new capabilities to query diagnostics. The first of these is a Diagnostics Options button on the Tools tab, which will take you to the Diagnostics page in the Options. This page will allow you to select your diagnostic outputs, including the level, as well as new additional diagnostics, the first of which we're adding is Performance Counters. Performance Counters is the other new feature we're adding to query diagnostics this month. With performance counters, you can come and you can see information about the actual resource utilization of your query. Here, you can see that we have ID, timestamp, information on processor usage, which if it's greater than 100 just implies usage of multiple cores, total processor time, IO data bytes per second, commit, and working set. You can easily get this information just by running a diagnose step or start diagnostics on a given query. However, there is a caveat. 
If you run it on a query that runs very rapidly, you may not get the information that you want. Here, I'm running it on a SQL query that is pushing down most of the operation to the backend data source. You can see that we get a result, no performance counters were captured during this session. This is because it pulls this information and it only does so every so often, which means for very fast queries, you're not gonna get anything useful out of it. This is aimed for heavier workloads that you really wanna understand what kind of resources it's utilizing. On the data connectivity side, we are happy to announce that we're bringing into beta the CDM folder view for the Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 connector. This will allow you to select if you'd like to view content in your data lake as CDM entities. You can learn more about this in the video description. Lastly, we would like to announce the availability of new instructor-led training. This month, considering global health concerns due to COVID-19, we've changed the Dashboard in a Day program to accommodate online delivery. These events will be scheduled on Microsoft Teams instead of in-person classrooms. Additionally, we're bringing you brand new Paginated Report in a Day instructor-led training as an addition to the online course that starts on April 1st. To learn more about either of these trainings, check out the links in the video description below. And that's all for this month. We hope you enjoy the updates and please keep sending us feedback on what you'd like to see in upcoming releases. Thanks for watching, stay home, stay safe, be well, and we will see you next month.